This is the second panel on the Skopje Forum. It's called The Future of the Balkan. Um, I know it's very uh, challenging uh, for this panel to uh, keep you awake after the lunch because uh, uh, the blood is in your stomach. But uh, we have uh, lined up uh, very uh, interesting speakers for the panel. Um, and they uh, will talk on a very important topic for uh, Macedonia and uh, the neighboring countries. Um, as we know, Balkans is inevitably part of Europe, but uh, still is not uh, part of the European Union. Um, however, unlike uh, the uh, 90s, uh, nowadays it's very clear that uh, every of the states uh, in the Balkans have a clear uh, European perspective as succession or candidate countries. Um, but uh, with a very uh, changing uh, Europe, uh, challenged by uh, own uh, problems like the financial crisis uh, and experiences of previous uh, uh, enlargements, um, uh, the um, final expectation of uh, the Balkan states uh, to become member states of the European Union is being um, also um, understood nowadays as uh, problematic. That's why this um, panel will uh, talk about uh, more broadly on the future um, of the European Union as a such and uh, how this reflects uh, the uh, Balkans uh, accession to the European Union and uh, specifically what um, uh, accession of the Balkan states to the European Union will mean for the Balkan states and for, uh, and for Europe. We have um, uh, four uh, panelists, uh, the Professor Dejan Jovic, uh, who is Chief Analyst and uh, Special Coordinator at the Office of the President of Croatia, but he's also coming from the Political Science Department of the University of Zagreb. Uh, we have Professor Viviana Vankovska, Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Cyril and Methodius here in Skopje. Um, Leon Nozovo uh, is Director of the Democracy for Development, uh, uh, an organization that has seat in Pristina. And uh, Professor Skiller Sofos, uh, who uh, comes from Wonderland, Sweden, uh, Lund University, the Center for Middle Eastern uh, Studies. Um, we, um, in the last two weeks, have heard a vibrant debate on uh, what are the strategies for uh, the EU. Uh, the Balkans' future in the European Union. Um, the uh, so-called um, European Policy uh, Advisory Group, welcome to, to the <laughs> for Europe Policy Advisory Group, that has been formed uh, by the European Fund for the Balkans and uh, supported through the Center for Southeastern European Studies of the University of Graz, uh, in which Dejan, me and Leon are part of have uh, devised four scenarios on uh, the future of the Balkans, one of them being um, the Big Bang scenario, where we expect that uh, the uh, Western Balkans will become EU member states, uh, where, where we request that the uh, Western Balkans 
becomes um, a member state uh, um, immediately uh, without uh, further uh, uh, going through the accession process. Um, the a second scenario, which is the scenario of business as usual, where EU is uh, taking its own time and uh, measuring uh, uh, the, uh, against the criteria for accession each of the countries that are acceding. And uh, the third scenario, the scenario of Turkification of some of the Balkan states, uh, being mainly Macedonia, Kosovo, and um, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, being left behind by the um, by uh, the other states from the Western Balkans in this accession process, uh, and the final fourth scenario, uh, which we called at some point the Ukrainian scenario, where uh, an external uh, power really uh, and another new player um, influences on the accession of the, some of the Western Balkan uh, countries. Um, I will invite Dan Jovic to start the debate and uh, maybe reflect upon some of these scenarios that we have discussed. Uh, and uh, uh, we will go further from there. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and uh, <laughs> thank you, Maria. <laughs> but yes, um, well, it's it's great it's a great honor and pleasure to be to be here and to thank you for the invitation. And uh, as Maria just said earlier, we've been discussing some of these issues for um, a while and produced uh, that paper that is now very much <clears throat> I mean the public domain. And uh, I participated in this um, in this paper trying to um, advocate, in a way, for this one of these scenarios, but also being very much open for the argument to the contrary. Um, and I would, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, this fourth scenario ended up with this Big Bang uh, uh, title or subtitle. But I think the better one probably would be Balkan Express. I mean, I think that would reflect a little bit better, I think, the idea or the intention of the, of the proposal. Uh, I must, however, first say that, irrespective of my official title in the office of the president, I'm here purely in personal capacity, so whatever I say really shouldn't be taken as an official view of the president of Croatia or any other institution in Croatia at all. And uh, it will become clear, I think, <laughs> in due course. Um, but anyway, I think this, this kind of idea or a notice should, should be said uh, up front. So let me just start with um, this week's um, um, celebration of the 25th anniversary of 1989 in Poland, when we got reminded that, that it was a quarter of a century since uh, the ending of the, of the Cold War in, in Europe, at least symbolically. And when I say in Europe, that doesn't mean that uh, the promises or hopes um, had actually been fulfilled in all the countries that were part of the East, in Eastern Europe. If we look, for example, the original promises or hopes, they were largely based on the idea of liberalization. And that is, there was an idea that actually with the ending of the Cold War, a liberal democracy had won, and that it had won so substantially that in fact there was no alternative, and there could be no alternative, even in the world of ideas. So there is no... This is a liberal paradox, that's how I call it. On one hand, you declare democracy, liberalism had won, and that means freedom. In fact, as the basic idea of liberalism is now, <clears throat> is now to come. On the other hand, you are saying there is no alternative uh, to that. And, and, and I wonder whether you can actually reconcile the two, uh, the idea that actually freedom had won, and uh, that there would be no alternative. But why am I mentioning this? Because it was assumed also that joining the European Union was the only way forward for uh, most of these countries, not all. And for those that actually this was not an option, what we see these days is uh, either a return to authoritarianism or a continuing of authoritarianism over these 25 years. Not all post-Soviet states have liberalized or democratized. <coughs> 
in many of them we still have authoritarian rulers and I think in, even in some of them actually the democratically elected lower rulers turned illiberal. So what we see is a illiberal democracy in a, a part of the continent uh, of the East in a way and we also have democratic illiberalism which means through democratic means you actually at a referendum occasionally vote for authoritarian solutions or conservative and authoritarian uh, solutions. So it's not as straightforward as we hoped or some of, the, some of them told us, actually some of the authors, enthusiastic authors of 1989 had told us that, 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 we would, uh, that would, what would happen um, in the aftermath of 1989. And uh, if we really look at the, the Western Balkans, um, it's not been the front runner either of the process of uh, ending of the Cold War. I wonder whether the Cold War would have ever ended had it been for us. <laughs> Probably not. Um, and neither it has been, in fact, a front runner in terms of liberalization. It seems to me that, in fact, what happened after 1989 is, with an exception of few countries, with an exception, actually a victory of conservatism rather than liberalism. And in many instances, the post-1989 situation meant returning to the practices of the past, reinventing histories and tradition, traditions, and in fact introducing a new type of illiberal democracy, should I say, instead of, of the one. And the actors quite often remain the same, or even worse, some of the authors that had been removed by liberal wing of the Communist Party came back as a nationalists although they had their role in the 50s and the 60s in some of our countries. And some of ideologies have been returned, have returned, and so on and so forth. And the role of, for example, church, and of illiberal or anti-liberal forces in society had, I think in particular in this part of the world, but also in much of the post-Soviet space, been very prominent. Now, uh, this leads us to the question of unfulfilled promises. And yet another one is, was given to West, West Balkan countries in 2003 at Thessaloniki meeting, where in fact this perspective of membership of the European Union was opened uh, and to a degree promised to all. But we are now 11 years since, and actually with an exception of Slovenia and uh, Croatia, no other post Yugoslav country uh, is a member. And I would dare to say that actually some of them are now further away from the membership <coughs> than three or four years ago. Certainly further away from before the economic crisis in Europe started. And yesterday and today we've heard how the European Union is closing down in a way and is kind of, uh, becoming more and more skeptical towards further enlargement. And actually I wonder if we had a summit today whether the European Union would be able to repeat that promise of Thessaloniki 2003. So the point I'm making here is that in fact the business as usual is unlikely a scenario because uh, it seems to me that actually even something that was possible that looked pretty much uh, likely to happen in 1989 that is liberalization of the whole continent or even in 2003, that is membership of all countries into the European Union, now seems to be more distant as an option. On the contrary, what we also see is actually the challenges to liberal democracy, liberalism as a concept, as an ideology, throughout the West. The European Union is basically a child of the liberal concept. Somebody mentioned Kant here. Kant was not only liberal, but certainly was the father of liberal thinking in international relations. Some would challenge that, would say he was more realist, but I think you know, we can discuss this in theories of international relations. Nevertheless, I think it is, he is taken as the father of the democratic peace and liberal, liberal peace theories and so on and so forth. But you know, to be liberal these days, you need to have a bit of a courage, I think, in Europe, both in the West and in the East. It is not a popular ideology, certainly not the one that had won in 1989 and was the only game in town, as Przewodzki and, and I think Klausov and others argued back in 1989, optimistically, I think. And uh, with the failure of liberal democracy, of liberalism, it's not about happening only in the Western Balkans or post-Soviet space, it's actually we are worried about one Hungary, we are worried about Greece, we are worried about France, we were worried about Finland and so on. It's actually throughout the European continent, irrespective of East or West, that we see challenges 
either from the point of view of uh, cons extreme conservatism or conservatism of one sort of another, or meritocratic governments that would replace democratically elected governments. We have elections in which we don't have an idea who has won. You know, in fact, even in, in big countries, where you know who might be the prime minister, but you're not sure for the next three months, because it's a meritocratic process after all, not democratic completely. Yeah. So the point I want to make here is that business as usual seems to me to be uh, quite an unlikely option. And if things continue as they are, uh, in my view, that would mean uh, basically no further enlargement. I mean, we saw yesterday that public opinion is against and more and more against. The countries are skeptical. There is a no enthusiasm for liberalism and so on and so forth. The other two options, I think, are something that we need to worry about. A uh, country that waits for 50 years to become a member of the European Union, or a country that actually had internal, serious internal conflicts, largely also in relation to the EU offer or lack of offer. Yeah. Because to be quite honest, uh, European Union behaved towards Ukraine at some point as somebody who is interested in some girl or a guy and uh, he hears that this girl or a guy is about getting married or getting into civic partnership to be politically correct with a third person. And then he comes to him or her and says, look, actually, you shouldn't marry her, him. Yeah. Uh, but when the, he does question the, the response back, well, does that mean you are proposing to me? And he says, well, actually, if you fulfill criteria, maybe one day in 30 years, this is not the way we should talk to countries that are perhaps that we are interested in, in particular, I think, especially if we like them or if we have some good good plans for, for them. And I, I think this is, this is this Ukrainian possibility, which is a missed opportunity and actually had a damaging consequence, I think, for the stability of Ukraine, but also wider. So what to do? I think we need to recognize that three uh, levels have changed. And I deliberately call this levels. Um, in a way, you know, thinking about neorealism in, 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 uh, in, in a nutshell. Um, so what has changed is uh, the European Union itself. It's no longer the same as it was 89 or 2003. It has, becoming, it has become less powerful, less attractive, I think, still, except in imagination. But in reality, everyone knows that money actually, you know, that whoever who needs to get money gets actually somewhere else. No, no longer to Europe. I mean, the main economic partners, you know, countries that have a lot of money are somewhere else, China, Russia, uh, Qatar, Emirates, Israel, America, wherever. Yeah? It's, not, it's not the only option. And then secondly, it's also become, it becomes less interested, uh, obviously, in, in, uh, in the rest of the, in the enlargement uh, process. What has changed also is the context. We are no longer the only game in town, I'm afraid. And Russia has shown us that. We shouldn't just you know, say, okay, nothing happened. I mean, a lot has happened in the Ukrainian crisis. I'm not gonna go into details, but uh, a lot has happened. And one thing that has happened is obviously that the European Union can no longer alone, on its own, decide on its eastern borders. It cannot say we will enlarge to this country without thinking about consequences. There is somebody else there. Also, the collapsing of Arab Spring has shown us, in fact, that democracy is not the only option. That we act, there is an alternative, and it may fail. And in fact, you know, we've also heard from China, from Chinese high officials saying, openly, democracy is not good for us. What if we tomorrow have some other big country saying, not neither it is good for us, and then some small country in the Balkans saying, and actually it's not good for us. And the trends you know, I don't know if I should call it Putinization or Erdoganization or perhaps like that. I mean, these trends are, these trends are happening in, in our countries as well. The government without opposition. The government that actually has the main aim of destroying any opposition and making it absolutely impossible. The government that, that thinks it will rule for the next 30 years. We see this in this part of the world as well. So there is already an ideological and political influence in our part of the world, which is not the ideal of the European Union of liberal age, in a way. And finally, thirdly, the Balkans has changed, as I said earlier. It is no longer none of these countries of the Western Balkans, or the, you know, the remaining Western Balkans, so to say, 
is uh, is or is going to become um, another Finland, as I used to call it quite often in the metaphor. Uh, these countries are complex. They all experienced very dramatic war. They are still dealing with consequences of that war. They have experienced uh, huge problems in all transition or aspects of transition, and this was a five-fold transition, including from war to peace and from one state to another, and in many cases transition in identities, where nations have changed names, or where a large segment of the population has changed self-identification, where people who declare themselves Yugoslavs had to choose their own personal identity different and so on and so forth. And also not to mention economic and political difficulties or transitions. Yeah. So it's a much more complex transition. Therefore, I think the European Union has basically only one choice, and this is, uh, so there is no alternative <laughs> to this, but I think if it is serious about uh, enlarging, about increasing or uh, maintaining its level of influence in the European continent, then it needs to rethink criteria for membership. It can no longer dictate, it can no longer even issue very strict conditions or add on the top of the, of, the, of the existing number of conditions, new and new demands, and this was the trend, you know, Copenhagen plus and plus and plus and plus and plus every time. So you have, you know, somebody who is more complex and you introduce new and new criteria, and you actually, you, you put it upper and upper and upper, the, the threshold, in fact. I think it's time to say, okay, do we really want them or not? And if we do want them, then we can't expect from countries that cannot meet these criteria to meet them. The outcome of this, of inflexibility, is only one. I think that this is pretending that we have reformed, simulating reform, something that Mieczysław Boduszynski calls simulated transition, even in the case of Croatia. So, European Union pretends Croatia is fine, Croatia pretends it has reformed, and once it gets into the European Union, oh, well, we are surprised. Uh, okay, and Bulgaria, and Romania, and everybody else. Everyone will pretend. Whether they will change, that's a different story. And I think if we analyze, for example, politics of some of these radical extremists of the 1990s who now become ardent supporters of European liberal values, you know, is this real change or is this pretending a simulation? We can continue like that, we can accept simulation for the real thing and say, okay, eventually we will agree on that. Or we can be a little bit more honest and say, look, you know, these are criteria that you absolutely must meet, but there is much of this which is actually, which is, uh, which is too much. And I think we need to be much more flexible about it. If we don't do that, and I'll finish with this, then we need to know that Europe is no longer the area of exclusive hegemony of the European Union. On the outskirts of Europe, we actually have a potential of bipolarity or multipolarity being created, and not only by Russia, you know, I mean by the United States and Turkey and possibly others, who have already been present and are present and have created some of these uh, external frameworks within which political system works. In Bosnia, even if Bosnians want to reform their political system, they cannot. And neither the Serbian Kosovo problem could be resolved only by people there, and neither Macedonian problem can be resolved without the involvement of the external elements. Uh, European Union in the first place, in particular two countries, or one, uh, or maybe three. <laughs> it depends, on, depends on, on how you look at this. So I think really we have a new situation, and to this new situation, the European Union, if it is serious, if it really wants to remain the only game in town, and any realist power will do that, I'm not sure whether the European Union can become one, uh, then we need to rethink criteria. And that's my proposal, therefore, to, um, to adopt, to take reality into account, new circumstances, and to start from, from there. Thank you. Um, so what I, uh, it was very interesting to hear that uh, um, there are three actually f changing factors in, uh, in the region, one being the Balkans that is continuously changing, the other one 
um, the external actors become more active and more important in the Balkans and the EU is not uh, the only game in town. And uh, the third, which is also very important, and that is the changing uh, of the European Union itself. Uh, we have just witnessed the latest EU elections and uh, there is a continuous state building process in the EU. Uh, Professor Vankovska, uh, how does this uh, influence the um, Western Balkan succession to, to the EU? Thank you. As uh, Dayan didn't speak in capacity of uh, advisor of the president, uh, let me uh, speak here on my own behalf, not as an uh, EU advocator or so, only as an intellectual. Uh, see, uh, the phrase, uh, there is no alternative, has been mentioned I don't know how many times this morning and, and this afternoon. So this is a very anti-intellectual position in general. This is something that intellectuals should deeply think about. And that's why actually I don't like very much these four scenarios because they are within this paradigm of there is no alternative or the fourth scenario, the third one, I don't remember which one was that, the Ukrainian scenario is a very bad one. So it is a scary movie in, in this uh, story. So this is something that we all should avoid at all costs. Um, in opposite to these four scenarios, I would think or I would uh, call for uh, imagination it is our duty to imagine a world that goes beyond liberalism, beyond capitalism, beyond this mainstream story about European Union. We just heard in the morning that it is not as uh, ideal as we all want to think about it. Uh, why don't we get courage to think about the fifth scenario that would be uh, closer ties of integration in the region that normally, naturally belongs to, to itself. And let's uh, think about the future of the Balkans, not of the Western Balkans. The Western Balkans is a creation of Brussels. It is nothing, there is nothing natural in, in this term. Uh, this Western Balkan, Balkans is uh, getting smaller and smaller which means that each new country from the Balkans that gets full membership becomes a form of a potential obstacle for the rest of the countries. Uh, they are, there were stories these days in, in the media in Macedonia that uh, there were allegedly some uh, debate uh, between the uh, Macedonian and Greek politicians uh, and, and the Greeks uh, said that they would do anything to prevent Macedonia to get into EU before Serbia. So I'm, I'm not very trustful in these uh, versions, but, but uh, there is a, a little bit of truth in, in this idea because uh, now Croatia can, of course, set uh, additional uh, criteria for Serbia's accession in the future. It is not still actual probably, but as soon as Serbia gets closer to, to full accession, mm -hmm. there will be some demands probably regarding the I don't know, reconciliation, genocide or whatever there would be. In general, I, I agree with the, uh, the picture presented by Dan. Um, the Balkan is dramatically changing, but to the worse. Um, I, it came to my mind uh, a, a popular novel of uh, Scott Fitzgerald, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. Actually, we are going, we are regressing, we are getting, instead of getting closer to the European Union, fulfilling some uh, demands and, and criteria, instead of uh, becoming stronger uh, democracies, we are becoming weaker and European Union, especially in Macedonia, becomes a security issue. European integration has been securitized. And that is, that is a very uh, disappointing for anybody who believed in, in this uh, vision. 
uh, when uh, it, it concerns, of course, the infamous name issue, but uh, the debate around the European Union, especially in Macedonia, Macedonia goes, if we don't uh, get into European Union, we are going to fall apart, there will be inter-ethnic war, uh, we are going to suffer economically, and so on and so forth. So it bears a debate of based on fear, on emotions, not on